Father, we are grateful that you give us the opportunity on this Saturday morning to gather as men. Um, many of us who come to this place with all kinds of things on our shoulders um, in different stages and seasons of life and marriage and family, with many questions that we are afraid to ask, with many answers that we don't have. And so we pray that as we talk about suffering over this uh, next several hours, that we would recognize that you are God who desires for us to be shaped into the image of your son, Jesus, who was made perfect through suffering, uh, who was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, familiar with suffering, one from whom we hid our faces. I pray that you would allow us to understand that Christianity, the end goal of Christianity, is to make us like you. And there is an element of suffering in you every day as you see the brokenness of this world. But that's what you sent your son Jesus for. And I pray that we rest in the hope that Jesus Christ is Lord, that in this world we will have tribulation, but we can take heart because you have overcome the world. That this is the only place we have to suffer if we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that we would rest in that hope, not only today, but rest in that hope uh, enough to share it with those in our community, with our families, and with the people we come in contact with. Would you let it be known that you are God and that I am your servant, that I've said all these things according to your word. Would you hear me so that all of the men here and all of the world may know that you are God and that there is none other. I pray that you don't just do a work here. Don't just do a work in Covenant Church. Don't just do a work in the churches that are represented here. But I pray throughout all of the world, people would come to know the Lord through what you do here today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I think the most appropriate... Um, <clears throat> The most appropriate way to start this morning is to at least communicate what I believe the Lord wants for us over the next several hours. And the best way to do that is to do two things, to give you expectation of what I'm going to be talking about today, but then also give you perspective slash context for why I'm not just communicating a text. Uh, and so today we're going to be focused on suffering all day long. That is the topic that we're going to uh, focus on. This morning, uh, we're going to focus on suffering from James chapter 1. And as we look at James chapter 1, uh, we are going to ask a bunch of questions of ourselves as we look at uh, what I'll call the promise of suffering. Um, I grew up as a, uh, a pastor's kid, grew up in Southern Virginia. I got saved when I was four years old. I asked the Lord Jesus to come into my heart and save me at age four. Um, I knew that the Lord had called me to full-time Christian ministry when I was age nine, started doing ministry when I was 13 or 14, something like that, and I have been doing ministry ever since. And so um, I got married in 2006, so my wife and I will this year celebrate year 13, which is great. We have seven children, and um, so seven children in 13 years lets you know that we don't use contraception because nobody would do that with using contraception. Um, and we did that because we believed that that's what the Lord called us to as a family. We believed that that was the, the biblical basis for how families should work. And so that being the case, um, we are in full-time Christian ministry now, and I wake up to teaching people about Jesus, almost literally wake up to teaching people about Jesus. That said, um, two years ago, June 1st, 2017, as we were living our happy life, at that time we had six children. Um, on June 1st, 2017, my youngest son then, whose name is Judah, um, started having seizures. Intractable epilepsy is what it's called, where they couldn't get control of the seizures at all. And so I went from uh, those of you who ever interacted with Judah, he is just the most loving kid ever. Um, the stories that people tell about Judah, uh, one of my favorite stories is um, we used to take our kids over the mountain to St. Paul's Presbyterian Church that, that a lot of you guys know about to CCA and uh, Tony Myers, who's the pastor that I now was telling me the first time he ever met Judah, Judah was running around in the gym and he came through the door and Judah ran and just grabbed his leg and held on to it as tight as he could. And then he says that Judah looked up and saw his face and recognized that he wasn't who Judah thought he was. <laughs> and Judah looked at him and said, hi, and then just took off running around the gym again and started having fun. Judah would hug anybody, just loved anybody. Judah's, one of Judah's favorite phrases was, if the Lord wills. And uh, I got to share the story because it's just funny. One night, my kids were talking about, my son Simeon was talking about how good he was at drawing something. And so I was just talking to him about boasting and what boasting means. And so I took him to the book of James and I said, you shouldn't boast in anything. Uh, even in tomorrow, you should say, if the Lord wills, we'll do this or that. And that night when I was putting them down, Simeon and 
Judah, I said, I'll see you guys in the morning. And Judah, without missing a beat, said, if the Lord wills. And from that day to June 1st, anytime somebody said what they were going to do, Judah would immediately respond, if the Lord wills. Well, on June 1st, when he got sick, um, we had no clue why he was sick. We had no clue what was happening. And so we watched that little boy uh, from June 1st to now deteriorate from the little boy who was running around and enjoying life at age five to now a seven-year-old who doesn't talk, doesn't walk, barely has any interaction with people, still suffering through intractable epilepsy. And we have no clue why. We have no clue when this is going to change or when this is going to stop. He was in a coma for 90 days from uh, June the 4th or 5th or so until August. Uh, they told us on July 17th his brain had experienced atrophy, which would be permanent brain damage. So they thought that he would only have what is called a sleep-wake cycle. That means he would be awake for a little bit and then he'd go to sleep. And that was about the only thing that would happen. Well, when he came out of the coma, he actually started tracking people around the room and holding balls and started moving his hands. And they had no clue that he would be able to do that when he woke up. And so he started doing rehab, and we thought he was on the road to recovery. February 13, 2018, we woke up to um, him having back-to-back -back intractable epilepsy again, which is called static, status epilepticus, which means virtually he's going to do nothing but seize until he either dies or his brain dies. And so that's what they thought would happen. Um, and so for about two or three months, he had seizures again, and then they stopped again. Nobody knows why, no explanation. And then he went back into status, and then they stopped again. Nobody knows why, nobody knows anything other than the Lord. So every single day, uh, I am now, Judah came home on November the 16th, 2018. And so, uh, I'm sorry, 2017, November 16th, 2017. And since that time, we have just been daily interacting with Judah, with our home care nurses, and just trying to take care of them the best that we can because we have no clue what's happening. And so the text that I'm getting to use for you as I talk about the promise of suffering, I have, to, I have to tell you my mindset going through all of this so that when we come to this text, you'll understand that my mindset was strange. Now, I told you I've been a believer since I was four years old. Started doing ministry, started preaching the gospel when I was between 13 and 15. My dad is an independent, fundamental missionary Baptist pastor who loves him some Jesus and loves him some Bible. If I'm going to be honest with you, whether I knew it or not, whether I like it or not, I started at some point embracing this idea that if you love Jesus and you do what's right, you won't get hurt. If you love Jesus and you try to follow him, nothing bad will ever happen to you. And you know where I got the idea, Psalm 91. We read the Psalm 91 book to our kids. We read that psalm. We hear it as Satan uh, seeks to tempt Jesus with it. But the reality is we don't see that in context, nor nor interpret it the way that the scripture should. For if it means what we think it means, it wasn't even true for Jesus. Because he was despised, rejected a man of sorrow, and then he ultimately was murdered for our sin. So that being the case, because I had embraced that lie, didn't even know I had embraced that lie, when God started doing that to my son, I immediately was angry with God for interfering in my life. You know you have a problem when you're, when you're angry at God for interfering in your life when you call yourself a believer. It's like, no, like the, the point is that you have my life. So as I come to James chapter one, with that context in mind for my own personal life, I want you to read, I want you to hear this text again in a lot of different ways. And so we're going to focus on three things this morning. The first thing we focus on is the, inevitab the inevitability of trials. I want to do that first by focusing on verses one through four. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes dispersed abroad. I have to stop there because it's important. We believe, according to tradition, that this James is the brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm amazed that he did not name drop that he was the brother of the Lord Jesus. Instead, he calls himself a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he tells us who his audience is by saying to the 12 tribes that are dispersed abroad. I'm not quite sure which diaspora this is speaking of. I'm wondering if it's the diaspora that was in Acts chapter 8 when everybody left Jerusalem because of the high persecution that we hear about, uh, or if it was a diaspora that happened later. Either way, these 12 tribes have been dispersed abroad, and I cannot but help but think that some of those people are thinking, wait a second, we love Jesus, we did what we were supposed to do, we believe that we were following the Lord, and we still are in a place that's different than what we anticipated. I love how James does not 
wait. Does it? I mean, he says, greetings to all of you. And then immediately, consider it a great joy whenever you experience various trials. If I'm going to be completely honest with you, going through what we're going through day to day, when I read a text like this, I immediately get angry. I would love to tell you that I love Jesus enough to where this text brings me great comfort and great joy. It doesn't because I immediately think this means that my trials are going to be inevitable. This means brokenness, this world that I live in, this fallen world that I live in is going to throw me tribulation after tribulation after tribulation. And God's expectation is not disappointment and anger, which is what I experience often. God's expectation is great joy. He says, consider it a great joy whenever you experience various trials. I need you to understand, I'm also talking to me, trials are inevitable. I'll tell you a couple of stories that happened. So June 1st, uh, my son went to the hospital. We had no clue what was happening. On June 4th, trying to get back, and mind you, they'll tell you, I'm a Christian camp director. So I'm directing, I was directing camp at the time. And then my son was in the hospital. So I was trying to run camp, be a dad to my son who was in the hospital at Children's in Pittsburgh, and take care of my other then five kids, okay? On June 4th, I'm driving, uh, I was getting ready to leave. I had just done open the night at camp. I was headed back to the hospital, and I thought I'm not going to take um, the way that I would normally go down 22, because if I do, I'm going to hit a deer. So I'm going to take the turnpike. On 7-11, I'm driving, and I hit a deer on the turnpike. Not only did I hit a deer, I think y'all would know what this is like. So I see the deer come to the edge of the road. I immediately slam on brakes. The deer looks like it's turning back to go into the forest. So I, there's nobody coming. So I get into the left-hand lane because I'm thinking, even if that deer turns around, I should be fine. I get into the left-hand lane. That deer turns around, starts running toward my vehicle in the left-hand lane, runs beside my vehicle, and then virtually tries to jump my vehicle. And I hit it square on. And I'm thinking, for real, Lord? Like, I have a son in the hospital. I'm tr Listen, I'm trying to do your will. We're not using contraception. I'm loving you as much as I can. I got married to this lady. I'm also interracially married. And I married my wife because God called me to. Not that she's not awesome. She's amazing. But at the end of the day, um, all of these things that I've sacrificed in life, I'm thinking, God, I've given up everything, man. And I'm, now I'm hitting a deer too? Like, what is wrong with you? You think that that's something. We get a call like three weeks later that I had an uncle. Um, that So that May, a cousin that I have, dropped dead at age 36. He was about to be 37. And we were at the funeral, and he was a believer as far as we know, so we had a great celebration time. Well, one of the uncles who was there that I spent time with, we got a call three weeks later after I've hit this deer and my son is in the hospital. He had fallen down the stairs, his kidneys were messed up, and he wouldn't live through the night. So there I am in the hospital trying to process, looking at my son in a coma, where I get this call that my uncle won't live through the night. The uncle I was just telling jokes with two months prior. Not only that, then, we continued to move forward and in November I get another call that another uncle has prostate cancer as a matter of fact we got the call in like September that he had prostate cancer and they didn't know how long he would live so he ended up dying in November so we met all of these families in the PICU one of the families we met had a two-month-old that perished in the PICU and there we were having just met these people praying with them for God to heal their daughter and about three weeks later that daughter we were we were praying with them as they were saying see you later to their little girl not only that, we met another family that I knew of in the PICU that on, I think it was October the 16th, um, it was actually September 23rd or 25th, I was there, we're doing a treatment with Judah, I ran upstairs to the PICU because she was back in the hospital, and I went and I prayed over her, and that next day she began to improve, and we started getting updates that she was improving, and then all of a sudden there were no more updates, and two weeks later, she passed. So it was the hardest thing I ever do to ask me to actually share at her celebration of life, and I went and I did that, and, I, and, and, and all of my processing, if I'm going to be completely honest with you, even though I know this text and I know what the scripture says, all of my processing was, God, what are you doing? Like, how, how do you justify allowing all of these terrible things to happen? Uh, particularly, um, this is just another side note, on November 6th, 13th, was my daughter's um, birthday, 
I was surprising my family. I was driving home from the uh, hospital. Um, oh, and we got pregnant during that time with Ash. It's just a lot happened. Um, and so it was November the 13th. It was a Monday. I was surprising my family. I was early. We were bringing you to home that Thursday, which was November the 16th. And I'm one mile from my house, and I hit another deer. And I'm thinking, Lord, like, I almost, yeah. So I got to tell this story now because I'm, I'm, I'm telling you all the crazy things that happened. Here's another crazy thing that happened. Went to a meeting, uh, sat down with a man who, in that meeting time, said he would give us resources to help us do camp. And he ended up giving us $20,000. I was so happy. So I jumped in my vehicle. Mind you, I had hit a deer already on June the 4th. This was like early July. I had already hit a deer. The bumper um, was hanging on by some screws because I didn't have time to get it fixed because I was in the hospital. <clears throat> I jump on the turnpike. I'm going 70 miles an hour on the turnpike. My bumper that is attached by screws on either end falls off in front of my vehicle going 70 miles an hour on the turnpike at 4.30 in the afternoon. I'm trying to find a place to pull over. Those of you who know the turnpike, I was at about exit 70, or uh, I was about exit 87. So there is no exit at 87. That's just a mile marker, if you know the turnpike at all. So I pull over. I happen to have tools in my vehicle, so I screw it back up. I put as many screws as I can across the front bumper just thinking this will be fine. I get back on the turnpike. I'm driving on the turnpike. Many of you know what a service plaza is. It's around exit, between exit 70 and 80. It falls off again. I'm going 70 miles an hour on the turnpike. There's traffic everywhere. I pull over right before the overpass, right before that service station. I'm looking at the service station. But now it's just my vehicle, a guardrail, and the road. I mean, that, that's it. And you know how tight that space is. And I remember getting under the vehicle, and I remember thinking, I'm going to screw this up one more time, and, and, I, and I hope that it stays. Well, all of a sudden, I hear this very loud, shrill sound. And remember, cars are still zooming past, right? And I look out from my bumper, and I see this 18-wheeler that chooses not to get in the left-hand lane. This 18-wheeler comes screaming past me, and just as it passes my vehicle, every time I tell this story, I'm like, this really happened. My, my life's a movie. The back wheel of the 18-wheeler exploded. When it exploded, the debris from the 18-wheeler was hitting my vehicle, okay, on the side of the road. I distinctly hear the Holy Spirit say to me, do not be afraid. And I'm like, Lord, have you lost your everlasting mind? If I was not next to this 18-wheeler exploding, I would not be afraid. Why are we talking about not being afraid when you, it does, I don't feel like you're protecting me? And I hear all of this protection from Psalm 91. I hear all this, and the Lord showed me something that day that I will never forget. When you wear a bulletproof vest, you're protected, but that doesn't mean you can't get hurt. And I think what I've done with the scriptures and what I've done with the Lord and what I've done even with James is I have, I have made the scriptures say something that it doesn't say. My idea is if God is protecting me, that means I can't get hurt. That's not true. Just like when I wear a bulletproof vest. I can get shot and it can hurt. I can still get bruised, but I'm still protected. And the Lord taught me something that day. He said to me, either I got you or I don't. And I said, well, I need to know that you got me. He said, don't be afraid. So I go back underneath the vehicle. There's debris in the road. Cars are swerving to miss the debris from these tires in the road. One car hits debris. It comes up. It hits the front of my vehicle. And I'm thinking to myself, God, I know you got me. But, like, what does that mean? Does that mean, like, you are going to let me get out of this unscathed? Or does this mean you're going to let me get out of this and put me in the hospital too? Because just because you got me doesn't mean I won't get hurt. And he said to me at that time something very similar as he's saying here. What he allowed me to understand is even if I get hurt, he still got me. But that's not what I want to hear. And that's not what I want to live. I want to be protected in a way that I'm far away from trials and far away from being touched by them. But that's not what God will allow us. In fact, God didn't allow that for his own son, so I'm not quite sure why he would allow that for me inevitability of trials. They're going to come. Number two, the maturity that comes from trials. Notice verse three. <clears throat> Whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. The opportunity, the, the opportunity that we have 
that comes from us experiencing trials is the reality that we can be mature. One of the things, another analogy that the Lord gave me that was really cool is, you know, when you are before age 16 or so, somebody is completely taking care of you for the most part. Somebody's providing your food, somebody's providing your clothes, somebody's taking care of you. You can stay age 16. You can stay for people, you just won't be mature. And what the Lord communicated to me was, I desire to be made perfect, complete, mature through success. But the reality is nobody has ever been made mature through success. We're made mature through our failures. At some level, greatness has to be seen not in what you accomplish, but in what, what you overcome. And so as I look at this text, the thing that is the most convicting to me is knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Wait, so God, by his grace, gives us faith and then tests it. Why would the God of the universe, who by his grace gives us faith, then test the faith that he gives us? He does that so that it can be proven to us that we have the very faith that he's given us and not a faith that we fabricated for ourselves. The one thing that I can know for sure as we've gone through what we've gone through with Judah is that I am in him and he is in me because there's no possible way I would be able to stand in front of you right now if I didn't know Jesus. No possible way I would not have already put a bullet in my brain if I did not know Jesus. It's just too hard to live every day. But the Lord continues to remind me, and I want to remind you, when you know Jesus and he's testing that faith, notice what James says. He says, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. It produces the ability to remain steadfast under trial. And guess what? Jesus said in John 16, in this world, you will have tribulation. Take heart, I've overcome the world. Let endurance have its full effect. In other words, let remaining under trial have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. I love working out. I love training athletes. That's what we do at Summer's Best Two Week City Kids. And so every single athlete that I train, most of the time, my goal is to make sure that they fail in the gym. Fact is, I was dropping Simeon off at school. Uh, he's my oldest son two days ago. And I said, Simeon, I want you to enjoy your day. I want you to share the gospel with people. But most of all, I want you to fail. He looked at me and he was like, what? I was like, I want you to fail, but I want you to fail forward. I love training football players. One of the things that we tell football players on offense is if you fall forward, you gain another three yards, depending on how tall you are. If you fall forward, you gain more yardage than if you fall backwards or to the side. Just fall forward. Fail forward. And the reason I'm saying that is remaining under trial, even if we are not doing it the way that we think we should, helps us become more mature. I, I, don't, I can't get any stronger in the weight room if I'm only lifting weights that I can lift. If I'm only doing reps that I can do. I have to do something that is harder for me in order for my muscle to grow. But we don't want to do that. I mean, I speak for everybody. I often don't want to do that when it comes to Jesus and, and knowledge of him. What I'd like to do instead, y'all, is I'd like to read my Bible. I'd like to buy osmosis uh, or like the Matrix. I'd like him to download all the information in my brain and then me heal people, me turn water into wine, me feed the 5,000, and me love people well. That's what I want to do. He communicated to me through this time. If you ever want to see a miracle, you have to live in such a way that a miracle is necessary. So everybody wants to feed another 5,000, but nobody wants to be hungry. Everybody wants the Red Sea to be split. Nobody wants Pharaoh chasing them. And nobody wants slavery. Everybody wants the miracle of the turning the water into wine. Nobody wants to be that bridegroom who was insufficient enough to provide it for everybody. The thing that the Lord has convicted me of more than anything else is I buy a Christianity daily that is not the Christianity of the Bible. Even though I've been a believer since I was four, I totally forget that every way that the Bible describes Jesus in Isaiah 53 is the exact opposite of what I want to be day to day. But the opportunity is there for me to mature to that. Can I show it to you real quick? If you would, turn your Bible to Isaiah 53. I just want to show you what the Lord showed me two days ago that, that really did uh, break my heart in some ways and comfort me in others. In Isaiah 53, I'm just going to pick up starting in verse 2. This is describing the Lord. Yes, sir. I need you to know that this is describing the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not just describing some random birth. This is describing the very Jesus that we proclaim to worship. This is him in earthly life before he came. And when I say before he came, I'm saying this description came before he came. When he came, he lived this description. He grew up 
before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He didn't have any impressive form or majesty that we should look at him, no appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned their faces from. He was despised, and we did not value him. Let me, let me do that in ways that we can understand. That means he was not impressive. He was not attractive. He was not accepted. He was not popular. He was not valued. Everything we want in life and in society, everything I want in life and society was the complete opposite of the very Lord that I worship and say I want to be like, and that God says in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, he wants to conform me to. If I really want to be like Jesus, what it means is I'm going to be the same way. That's the end goal for me. And if I don't want that end goal, ultimately, I don't want Jesus. Now, please don't walk away going, well, Timothy said that there is nothing abundant about the Christian life, that it's just drudgery and terrible. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm also trying to get us to understand is Jesus did not receive the reward of his suffering until heaven. The reality is you and me, who Jesus came to go after, he didn't really get us the way that he wants us until we get there to be with him in heaven. Other than that, on earth, this was the place that he suffered. And Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10 says that he was made perfect through suffering. And we also will be made perfect through suffering. We'll be complete and mature, as this text says, lacking nothing. You want maturity? You got to suffer. That's the reality for anything. My son hates math. I'm like, do you want to grow at it? Yes. Then you just got to suffer through it. You just have to if you want to mature at it. But if you don't want to mature at it, you can leave it alone. Somebody once said to me, do not expect too much out of a fallen world and do not expect too little out of a risen king. I think I do that. I want the world to do something that God never meant the world to do. The world was not, the world was made for me, not me for the world. So I want to go to the third and final point this morning. That's the intimacy that trials, the, the opportunity that trials bring, the opportunity that suffering brings. So we just talked about the inevitability and the maturity. I want to talk about uh, the opportunity. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly. It will be given to him, but let him ask in faith without doubting, for the doubter is like the surging sea driven and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from God. I want to say that again. That person should expect to receive, not to receive anything from God. Being double-minded and unstable in all of his ways. Let the brother of humble circumstances boast in his exaltation. Doesn't that seem out of place? It's like, what, why would you go from this asking for wisdom thing to the brother of her, humble circumstances boast in his exaltation and the rich boast in his humiliation? Oh, I get it because if I'm lacking wisdom and, I'm, and I need to ask God for wisdom, there's a humility there that allows me to understand that I'm not yet mature. So that when I'm going through what I'm going through with Judah and I don't understand it, I don't have the wisdom to get it, I don't have the clarity to receive what is happening, in humility I have to come to God and go, God, will you help me understand what's going on? This is what the Lord has allowed me to recognize that's really cool. I don't need to understand what's going on. Oh, I want to. You better believe I want to. And when I get to heaven, I want just to corner God for like 30 minutes and just go, hey, what, what, was, the, what was you thinking there? Just, I just want to, like in y'all's playbook, when you was going over the plan and the film, like I want to know what you thought you were doing there because I just want to get it. Here's a question. The Bible says, faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love, right? I started asking the question, am I asking for wisdom in this situation with Judah because I want to understand or because I want to grow in faith, hope, and love? Namely, love. I'm not asking because I want to, if I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not asking because I want to grow in faith, hope, and love. I'm asking because I want to know what's happening. But the Lord is continuing to convict me that he wants to bring me faith, hope, and love. And so the brother in humble circumstances should boast in that. He should be excited about that. That is the counterintuitiveness of Christianity, that the person in low estate should boast, but the person in high estate should not, unless they're being humiliated. They should rejoice in their humiliation. But why does he say that? 
because the sun rises and together with the scorching wind dries up the grass, its flower falls off and its beautiful appearance perishes. In the same way, the rich person will wither away while pursuing his activities. What does he mean? He means, look, we all going to die and things all tend toward entropy and atrophy. At some level, no matter how rich you are, you're going to die and your stuff is going to be given to somebody else. Read the book of Ecclesiastes. What he's communicating is rejoice when you humiliate it because ultimately that's the tendency of life. The tendency of life is it's going to bring trial, broken things, and hard things. And I have met people who have heard me proclaim a message like this who are believers who say, Timotheus, my life is not that hard. My next natural question is, how, how closely are you following Jesus? Because as, as I get closer and closer to him, the harder and harder my life becomes. And there are many who think if I come to Jesus, it becomes easier. Not, 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 not if you follow him. I told my wife one day, I think we're in good company. As much as this hurts, we're in good company. I don't think Isaiah was excited about walking around naked for three years. I think if you asked Ezekiel, hey, do you want to cook your food over, over dung? I think he would have said, absolutely not. What are you on? I think if you asked Jeremiah, do you want to be in this cistern because you preach the word of God? No. I think if you said to Stephen, Stephen, you know, hey, they get ready to stone you in a few minutes. Are you cool with that? I think Stephen would have been like, I'm not really cool with that, but if it happens, it happens. Ten and twelve disciples were martyred. John was boiled in hot oil, according to tradition, and then sentenced to the island of Patmos, where he died of old age. I'm sure he died of being boiled in hot oil, but we call it old age because he lived through that. The reason I'm saying it is trial is going to come, and brokenness is going to come. But blessed is the one who endures trials, because when he has stood the test, that's my favorite part of the text. I'm not standing through this trial, and this is not the only trial, but I'm not standing through it because of who I am. I'm standing through it because of who the Lord is. Here's the coolest part. I mean, let me say something else about verse 6 that's, that's real cool about verse 6. Let him ask in faith without doubting, for the doubter is like the surgency driven uh, and tossed by the wind. I wrote this in a journal, and I, and I want to remind myself and read it to you. The doubter goes back and forth without making a firm decision because his wisdom does not rest on the knowledge of God built over time by remaining under various trials. God gave us the faith with which to ask, so if we are doubting that God will answer, we are also faithless and thus doubting God. So that's the key, that the doubter who is, he's not just doubting whether or not he'll get wisdom, he's doubting the very God whom he asks for wisdom. Again, maturity is the standard, and even when we ask, God will still answer by proving our faith. The doubting is not in what we ask about, but in the God we are asking from. When we pray and ask for wisdom, we ultimately are asking for God. The thing is, I think often I want from God to do with whatever he gives me, to do whatever I want with whatever he gives me, when ultimately I need to be asking for him. And in this trial with Judah, I need to be asking for more of him. And if I'm be honest with you, I'm afraid to get more of him. Because when I get more of him, that means I lose more of me. And the more I lose more of me, I remember driving to the hospital one night and I said, Lord, I just feel like you are stripping everything. Light bulb came on. Hopefully it just came on for you too. If God can strip me of something, that means he doesn't have everything. If he can take something from me, that means I haven't given it to him. And I didn't know how much I had made an idol out of my family because, again, I was in full-time Christian ministry. I'm doing the Christian thing. I recognized through the last two years of my life that I've loved God the worldly way. I didn't even know that I was doing that. So blessed is the man who endures trials because when, when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. I read that to you, reminding you and reminding myself of what I came to in verse 6 because he'll receive the crown of life. And there are those who argue over whether or not this is an actual crown or not, but this is something I know for sure. That crown of life really does allow us to understand that eternal life is knowing God the Father and Jesus whom he sent. That's John chapter 17, verse 3. Ultimately, through trial, we get to mature, and the Bible says we will be complete and mature, lacking nothing. So when I ask you this question, do you really want to grow? I'm not really asking, do you want to? grow because you're already living whether or not you want to grow what I'm asking you instead is how much of God do you want 
Now I need to make this statement, and then I'm going to close this morning. You have as much of God as you want. He is not in heaven going, I don't want you to have any. No, the reality is he wants you to come to him. He wants to give himself to us. So if we're going, I just want more Jesus, he, he wants you to have more of him than you do. He cares more about your sanctification than you do. He cares more about you knowing him than you do. So if you're going, I need to know more about Jesus, I want to know more about Jesus, he wants that way more than you do. So what's standing in your way? What might be standing in your way? The suffering itself. What the suffering you're already going through or the suffering you're afraid to go through when you turn toward his face and follow him on the road that he walked. Can I just tell you? You can choose to do that. You just won't be complete and mature, lacking nothing. Father, we are grateful that you've given us your word to let us know that you really do want our maturity. You want us to be complete and mature, lacking nothing. But I will readily confess to you, I don't want maturity. I want the knowledge. I want to be able to tell people about you. But I often don't want maturity. I don't want the growth that you want to bring through trial as I endure it, as I stand under it, as I remain under that faucet of suffering and trial. So as crazy as it sounds, Lord, I thank you for what you've done with Judah because it's helped me see you in a way that I've never seen you before, in a way that I need to see you in order to know who I'm supposed to be.